G'day North Queensland and for this case possibly Australia because this is a pretty big issue we've got here. Uh, today we're going to talk about the lovely red ensign and exactly what's going on. There's been a hell of a lot of uh, misconception perhaps, distortions of truth, whether people are doing it intentionally or they've just been educated inappropriately is something to be seen. But today I'm here with Colette from the House of Jeffs. That's me. And yep. um, she's done some amazing work. And as you can see from the plethora of research and evidence we have here of the existence of said red Big ensign. Yep. Um, wow. We, we've got the evidence. <laughs> so where does this all begin? Well, in 1901, the foundation of this uh, federal red ensign where um, it was brought to us through a competition of the people entering um, to put a flag and a seal for the new constitution. So, so 1901 was when um, Australia federated, so yes. all state borders were dissolved that's and right. pushed 12 miles out to sea as I understand it. And that's yes. what, you know, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But at this point of federation, we've created the first Australian flag. Yeah, well, the Commonwealth of Australia. Commonwealth of Australia flag, yes. as stated in the Constitution. As stated in the Constitution that was proclaimed and gazetted, yes. yes. Right. Yeah. And as you said, there was a, a big competition, with some 30,000? 30, 30,000 entries for this, yes. And of that 30,000 entries, five were closely look at, looked at, and this one was the one that won. This one? This one, yeah. yeah. This one. <laughs> At that point, it obviously had to go off to England as a as, part of the Commonwealth. Yes, as part which of Which is yes. important to remember, you know, there, there is, you know, although federated, we are still part of the, of the Commonwealth. Commonwealth. Two years later, she returns. Yes, yes, and that's officially our flag. Our flag, and importantly, our land flag, unlike all the other flags that are maritime or um, admiralty. They can only be flown at sea and represents the vessels. So in 1903, when that approval process is complete from said Commonwealth, yes. um, King Edward was it? Edward the Seventh, yeah. yes, King he approved Edward it. Edward comes back, says that she's all good, you can go along with that, but... We need to put some for maritime because we have to be res represented on the sea as well. Okay, so what's the difference between the maritime and the land flag? Well, the size of the flag, so we're a two to three, three to two ratio, uh, for the land and a one to two ratio for the Admiralty Maritime. Also the stars are different so although we still had both six-pointed star under the Union Jack the uh, Southern Cross was different. The Southern Cross was lined up whereas here you can see it's off centre mm. and it goes from the brightest star nine, eight, seven, six, Five to the lowest, whereas on the others it, it didn't. It went seven and then one five. Yeah, so it was different. So they were all seven, with the exception of the small. Star. Small was five. Yeah, and that was out at sea. Mm -hmm. And is there a significance to the points on the stars? Yes. Well, in in these ones, the the, the brightness of the stars that we see that we look from the land. So mm -hmm. as we would look at the Southern Cross from the red earth, the red dirt, representing that red duster we would see those looking like that on an angle. Whereas at sea, you're moving all the time, they've just straightened those, one top and one bottom. Yeah, so there. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So moving along, we've established two different red ensign flags, one land, one sea. We move into the Treaty of Hague in 1907. Yes. What's, what is the Treaty of Hague? Well, it was, um, because we were part of the Commonwealth, there was wars passed that debts had to be paid and uh, those debts had to be paid and they were thrown over to us, to the Commonwealth. And in The Hague, when they weren't paid, we, we wore the burden of that. We were put into what they call a usufruct. All right, and what does that mean? Usufruct means they can use the fruits of the land, so your forestry, your fisheries, your minerals. They can also use the fruits of your labour. So effectively enslaving the people in a sense? To pay debts, correct. Right. And which debts are we paying? We're paying debts from past wars. So because we're part of the monarch, the monarch went into wars with different countries like the Americans where they did the um, civil wars and they had the war of independence. 
both of those, both the Americans and the English, were in debt to the banksters. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We didn't know them as banksters then, but they were in debt because they financed both sides of the war. Yeah. When that debt didn't get paid, it has to go to a treaty for it to be worked out, how are you going to pay for this? Just mm -hmm. like any bill that you don't pay, yeah. it goes to a court and it gets decided who and how that gets paid. And so our usufruct was, we was put into usufruct. So that had to be delivered to us in 1907. That was handed to the military hand, which was the America's white fleet. And they went around the world delivering these to people that were into this debt to pay back the way the Hague had described. Mm. There was eight treaties in all, but the most important was the one war on land because it tells them how to conduct themselves while in war on land. And the Americas are, you know, the, the, the Union forces, and yeah. they, they've come into our shores, Sydney, I believe. Yes, into guns Sydney Arbor. Guns pointed, Come, which guns is always a sign of friendliness. Yes. You know, I mean, you well, know, we were being hi, friendly. how are you going, you know? Um, we were being friendly because we were all good little people waving American flags, mm. not knowing that what was being delivered. The USA fleet welcome to Australia. Yes. Um, with guns drawn. With the guns so drawn, <laughs> yes. The, here's the image, you can see it for yourself. Make your own mind up what that means. Like, well, I've got a very interesting artistic interpretation and of that, that one. And you can probably interpret a lot by that picture. Yeah. So, so we're, we're basically told at this point, pay your debts. Yes. Right, so how do we proceed with paying those debts? Well, we go into administration. So, like we said in 1908, there was a military order sent to the people running the country at the time, so our parliamentarians, and it was telling them that they needed to add an extra star to this six-pointed star that sits under the Union Jack to include the territories. Now, that sounds quite harmless, maybe, but territories, if you think of something marking its territory, that's exactly what they were doing. So we have our territories, we've got the Northern Territories that's got Pine Gap that was sold for a peppercorn. And we've got added territories now where we've got Jarvis Bay, which is our naval base. We've got Canberra, which is a territory. And on Capitol Hill, we have that parliament sitting there. The alleged the seat alleged, of government. Yes, the alleged seat of government In a flying a blue territorial flag. Yeah, which we'll come to. Yes. And then in 1910, it all became official. Because like anything, the paperwork comes in and then it comes out the other end saying it's official. Mm. The 26th of January, 1910, we officially were being administered. Mm. We were occupied and we were working under treaties, eight of them. Anyone can look up those treaties, go to the Australian Treaty Series, series look at 1910, and it will show you eight treaties, and particularly the one on war on land, because mm. it explains how they can conduct war on land. So here we are, 1910, Australia Day is created, and we're all sort of led to believe that it's this wonderful foundation sort of day. Mm. We've got a whole bunch of other people who are running around calling it Invasion Day, and perhaps they're not too far from the truth in a sense, because well, this is, but that it's is not the manner in which we've all been led to believe. No. So, so who exactly has invaded? Well, I mean, the Americans have obviously come in guns drawn. Yes. But who sent them? Well, for those people out there that's been down the rabbit holes. A rabbit hole warning. A rabbit hole warning. We've got, um, they're all a trinity. We've got Washington DC, which is the military armed force, which is in British Columbia. That's the White House there and therefore the command. Mm -hmm. And then we've got that magic mile of London City, which is run by different police than outside of that one mile. And that's the financial aspect. Then we've got the Vatican City, which we know uh, takes all our souls into it. And that's their Holy Trinity. So one ha heavy hand of the... You could say mind, body and soul. Mind, body and soul, yes. Yeah. And they sent their military arm to deliver this treaty to us, yes, yeah, these treaties. Although in 1910... Which is the uh, point of treaty. 
which we're led to believe is Australia Day, but it's, we we'll probably call it, um, you know, in invasion. Day, quite, invasion. You know, as, as much as the leftists still like jumping up and down, going, "Yes, I knew I was right, but you yeah. were still wrong because you got your facts wrong." Yeah. But anyway, so we moved to 1940. Yes. You know, we we joined World War, World War, War One, and we have again a plethora of images showing Our this flag. red ensign being flown. Mm -hmm. alongside our troops yes so it, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt you know we, we have historical evidence, evidence. This, you know as we proceed through the war war ends 1917 and again we come to more treaties yes uh, during that treaty I believe there is also a significant change in Australia Day at this point it is yes because uh, this lady who had uh, sons that were in the war and relatives in the war decided to ask the news or put it to the newspapers that we should raise money for the wounded for the soldiers that didn't come back to help the families so from that point on every last friday of july every year they were uh, making match boxes with the different things on badges and selling these to help the people that came back from the war and so that was the official Australia Day. So it was kind of a bit of an Anzac Day almost. Well, it, it was in a way. Yeah, it was in a way. Yeah, you know, I guess maybe not Anzac. It was, it was definitely an Australia thing. Yes, Anzac yeah. 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 Sure. So it had nothing to do with any White Fleet or anything like that. Or it was more to help the people mm -hmm. that lived in the Commonwealth of Australia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So then we move in to the Treaty of Versailles. Which is the end of the war. Yeah. yeah. That was a peace treaty. And it was signed, and we had a representative of Billy Hughes that came, was in the our representative for the Commonwealth of Australia, and he stood for the sixty-two thousand lost souls that shed blood for this country, and he fought to get the part of New Guinea that was occupied by the Germans. So what they did at that peace treaty was divide up the occupied land that they'd taken. And uh, Woodrow Wilson didn't think, because he was the American president, that why should he get all of that? He really wanted a bit of it and everyone should have a piece of it. But Billy Hughes stood there and said, well, um, as, as a point of where we could be invaded, that was important to us on our land, because Papua New Guinea is within our water, in, in the waters. So they drew a line around the waters of Papua New Guinea and introduced them into our country and Billy Hughes said it's ours because of the 62,000 soldiers lost and those 62,000 soldiers although didn't seem many in number compared to other countries percentage wise we had the greatest loss because we were a very small country then with a small population so 62,000 was a lot of yeah, it's, yeah, a, big yeah. it's a big chunk of our population and so they caved and they give him Papua New Guinea and put the waters in there so Papua New Guinea came into our waters um, is there any other significant point to the Treaty of Versailles that affects the flag that was recognized in international peace right so that, that was a peace, peace treaty, yeah. yes. And yeah, as part of the... Like, we have evidence, yeah, course, yes, so under the British Empire. Yes, we also have evidence in that same picture of the fact that New Zealand had a red flag, Canada had a red flag, South Africa had a red flag, the Commonwealth countries had a red flag. Yet Menzies tried to say it looked too communist, so we should so use Menzies the blue. Menzies comes in, we're moving into that, you know, Na the Nazis are building their strengths, you know, socialism is starting to take a hold, it's, it's already got a stranglehold in Russia and I believe a couple of other countries around Europe and whatnot. Um, it, dark days are upon us because of socialism, mm. accepted. Um, and Menzies says what about our flag? Yeah, well he, well he said, well first he said we should go to war. Alright. And unfortunately because in that peace treaty we became a nationhood under international law under peace we should have stood up and said no so as a part of that treaty we, we accepted peace and we're not going to go start in a war yeah we dropped. shouldn't have had to Don't we could have. yeah we yes we could have mm. but at the time we dropped the ball and we went to war so we broke that peace treaty and we went to war and he said that flag looked too communist because they already had their little blue flag sitting in the background. Mm. 
and he was trying to push in the blue flag. Yeah, and this is where we do our Tarantino moment and refer back to our previous mention of said blue flag that's been set as a, a government flag, flag from, from the early days of the creation. With the flag. seven points for a treaties that is clearly not on there in World War One and World War Two, so it was sitting, lying there, waiting. Right. So during World War II, we're still flying red flag. Yep. But our Prime Minister at the time is starting to fly the blue flag. Well, yes, they've got that. The government's got that, yes. But it wasn't official because under everything, the flag acts, it has to be official. It has to go through the Commonwealth, through the monarch, and it has to be put into the flag acts. It was all done around 1953, 54 officially in the flag acts, all around the time of the coronation when the crown changed, the flag changed. World War II is done, we've fought another world war with this flag, so when we look at our Anzac memorials, what flag should we really be flying? flying? Exactly. The, you know, I'll leave that to you mob to figure out. Yes. But these are the facts. In 1953 we have the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Yes, where she had two crowns that day, which is not unusual with the uh, royals because they were originally Catholic before Henry VIII until then and uh, now she's the head of the Church of England so we need uh, an imperial crown and our soldiers had the imperial crown they wore the imperial badge the, the rising sun and the imperial crown was in there all of that changed in 53 oh, we lost it off our police police officers. Well, we lost it, all right. We <laughs> lost it. <laughs> what good timing. <laughs> what good timing. But let's not forget, it's not lost because we haven't forgotten. That's right. So in 53, we changed the crown, we changed the seal, we changed the uh, flag, we changed the name of the forces. They were the Imperial Forces. Now they're the Australian Defence Force. The place where the Roman crown and the Roman wreath and in, in Queensland we even have the Maltese Cross which the country of Malta is Catholic. So how clear can we be that we're not Protestant or Protestant like in our Constitution? We should, in our Constitution it states we are under Almighty God, the KGV, the authorised KGV 1611 Bible. It's in our sh shrine of remembrance and yet we're under a Catholic regime right now. So over a period of 70 years we've basically had history rewritten. That kind of leaves us in a very interesting predicament and hopefully that um, helps the people at home understand the true value of the flag that fell down. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, you know, when we're flying that flag, it's not to try and symbolise communism as some yes. mainstream media outlets have suggested. Wow, that's just regurgitating what Menzies yes, said. said. You know, it is. propaganda back then. It is. You know? But when they see the Commonwealth flags of the time, where they were all red, mm. it doesn't stand up. We had four Commonwealth yes. flags with red and two, what, Russian and China that were red. I think we outnumbered them. Mm. So it didn't make sense at all. It's just that their flag was blue and they had a plan to introduce it, all part of the plan. We could probably dive down further rabbit holes at this point, but we should probably just sort of Stick. leave it here for now. Um, hope this has helped everybody understand a little bit more about the red ensign, um, that it, is, seem, it does seem through evidence here to be the true flag of Australia and the blue flag is the government flag, so... Yeah. Yeah. And we've got to stop calling it Australia. We've got to call ourselves the Commonwealth of Australia. As much as you can clearly see here in 53 that we were, the monarchs sort of turned their back on us. Mm. And I can add to in 57 at our first, um, um, what would you say, Christmas greetings to the public by black and white television. Happy Christmas. 25 years ago, my grandfather broadcast the first of these Christmas messages. Today is another landmark because television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. My own family often gather round to watch television as they are at this moment. And that is how I imagine you now. 
I very much hope that this new medium will make my Christmas message more personal and direct. I hope that 1958 may bring you God's blessing and all the things you long for. And so I wish you all, young and old, wherever you may be, all the fun and enjoyment and the peace of a very happy Christmas. She stated clearly that she cannot assist us in, in war, she cannot lead us into war and she cannot lead us through the courts in, into law. Mm. So th clearly turned it their back on us. Definitely. And again, further cemented in 73 with what Gough Whitlam did. Did. Yes. Creating this fictitious corporate, corporate. version and yeah. Yes. Here we are about to dock. We're standing at the edge of a new rabbit hole. Mm. And oh, I think we, you know, if you're interested in that, you should definitely look for yourself. I know perhaps we might do another video at some point, you know, explaining, explaining exactly what happened in 1973. Three. And, you know, I mean, God, where we are the now. The only Prime Minister to be forcibly removed by the Governor General. Yes, yes. You know, I think we'd all love to see some more. May I say, God save, God save the Queen, because nothing can save the Governor General, was his speech. Yeah. God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. The proclamation which you have just heard read by the Governor General's official secretary was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. undoubtedly go down in Australian history from Remembrance Day 1975 as Kerr's Kerr. Yes. I think we should leave it here for today. Thank you yeah. very much. Can I just say one last thing? Just remember this is the only land flag. All the other flags that they're waving around are Admiralty and they're putting you back at sea. And if you've dealt down that rabbit hole, you don't want to be at sea because you're drowning. Yeah. Dead entity. Dead entity. Just diminish the maxima. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. There's some lovely terms for you to look up and, you know, leave you hanging on the edge of the seat. What's he saying? What does that mean? Look it up. Find look it out. up. Do some research. Exactly. You know, and you've done some amazing web, uh, web research and so have a lot of other people to bring mm. us this information. Um, and thank you. Well, most, most of this is people's collections from their homes and from their families that's been passed down. So thank you to those people that save stuff so that... They can change our history however they like, but we've got the evidence to prove it wrong.